Thank you, Jackie and Andrew, for the invitation to all the people that helped make this event possible. Um, so I'm going to take a also sort of an evolutionary perspective that bringing in perhaps a bit more neuroscience on this question of music and meaning. Um, so broadly, it's an interesting question to ask how tones and rhythms without propositional semantic content can become so meaningful to us. So when I listen to this classic album by Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, I find it deeply meaningful, but it doesn't have the kind of meaning we get when we speak words to each other. Um, so where did that come from in evolution? Um, well, actually, getting meaning out of instrumental music um, seems to be quite old. The oldest known instruments are bone flutes, uh, unearthed in southern Europe that date to about 40,000 years ago. So people have been making instrumental music for a very long time. Um, and that flute, um, as old as it is, is, of course, is just at the very top of the story of human evolution. Um, in this slide from a, a, an article in Nature trying to summarize some of the trends of human evolution with a Homo erectus ancestor on the bottom over the course of two million years uh, through various branchings, finally leading up to Homo sapiens. So, so we can imagine that deriving meaning from music um, is, has ancient roots. Now, we know, of course, from the work of music cognition uh, researchers and people like Fred Lairdahl here in Columbia that uh, modern music cognition processing is a very complex business um, that in, engages very sophisticated processing, but of course, that must be building on simpler things that came before. So what is the history of this? Um, one way of asking this question, of rephrasing it, is to ask how ancient are the brain mechanisms that we use to derive meaning from instrumental music? And you know, when we look around the animal kingdom, we see all kinds of behaviors that people have labeled with music-like terms, like bird song, or gibbon song, or whale song. Even fruit flies have a courtship song, actually, that they make with their wings. Um, so the idea that using tones and rhythms to communicate meaningful things has an ancient history resonates with many people uh, that predate, predate humans. Um, and Darwin had the view that our uh, sense of music had ancient roots, writing in The Descent of Man, that the perception, if not the enjoyment, of musical cadences, meaning melodies, and rhythm is probably common to all animals, no doubt depending on the common physiological nature of their nervous system. So something about melody and rhythm processing, not word processing, it's just pure instrumental music, as my, all my talk will be focused on, uh, touches into something deep in, in biology. So this is the widespread intuition that some of the mechanisms of music processing, instrumental music processing, are very old. Much older, say, than mechanisms we use to process language. Um, I think it's a widespread intuition. I think Gary Larson captured it nicely in this cartoon, what we say to dogs. Uh, oh, Ginger, I've had it. Uh, keep out of the garbage. This is the last time I'm telling you, uh, or else, and what they hear, blah, blah, Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, uh, you know, we kind of find that fairly convincing. Um, but when it comes to music, it's somewhat a different story. This is one of my favorite pictures of Glenn Gould at the piano with his dog. And the idea that maybe uh, animals share more of our sense of music than they share of our sense of language is actually a pretty widespread intuition. Probably what's behind the uh, glut of CDs for dogs on Amazon.com. Um, these are just two of many that you can purchase. These, these things have hundreds of ratings on Amazon. They're rated very high by their customers. Um, and uh, one of my favorite letters I've ever gotten was from a linguist who wrote this to me uh, after my book came out, uh, Music and Language. Um, my late Irish setter responded most remarkably to radio broadcasts of chamber music by Beethoven and Schubert, though more to the works of Beethoven's middle period than those of his later period, <laughs> which I had preferred. In consequence, I started listening more closely to the works of the middle period and came to appreciate them more than I previously had. All right, so the idea that you know, animals are getting something out of music is kind of widespread. Um, now, some of the brain mechanisms of musical meaning are, I think, very old, and David has touched on some of these things that brains do for evolutionary reasons that are relevant to music, and I think there's a lot to that, and I love this picture of David striking a very similar pose as that portrait of the young Charles Darwin. Um, but I think what I want to convince you of today is that some of the mechanisms are surprisingly recent, and these have to do with things about recognizing sounds, predicting sounds, and having emotional responses to sounds, very particular aspects of those features that I'll talk about. Um, but how do we know that these things are recently evolved? How can I stand here and say that some things about music cognition are recently evolved? You know, we don't have the luxury of fossils in the uh, music uh, evolution world. So there's another great cartoon from Gary Larson of ja Java Man, Peking Man, Cro-Magnon Man, and Jazz Man. Uh, you know, we don't unfortunately have the luxury of that kind of fossil evidence for music cognition. So how do you reconstruct the evolutionary history of music cognition when you don't have fossils? Well, 
three steps. First, you take a multi-component approach, and you recognize that music processing has many distinct cognitive components. It's not one thing in the brain, it's many interacting things. And these distinct components are supported by distinct brain networks, not individual areas, but, but networks. And so it's not phrenology, it's, it's, but the idea that different things get processed by different networks is, is widespread uh, in cognitive neuroscience. And these, these, these different processes interact, but they can be studied in, independently. And this is just bread and butter cognitive neuroscience. The idea that certain aspects of melody are processed independently of certain aspects of rhythm in the brain and then put together and so on. It's supported by research on dissociations after brain damage, including by people like Isabel Peretz, who you mentioned earlier before. Step two is distinguish music from musicality. Music being a cultural and historical product, like the music of Miles Davis, but musicality being the mental processes that underlie musical behavior. And this is thought to be much less culturally variable. There was a conference on this uh, in the Netherlands a few years ago that resulted in a special issue of a journal on the origins of musicality. Um, but let me illustrate what I mean by musicality. So the ex one, a simple example is the recognition of transposed melodies. So that means melodies that are shifted up or down in pitch. So you can recognize the happy birthday tune effortlessly, whether it's played on a piccolo, even though you may never have heard it played that high before, or on a tuba, even though you've never heard it play that low, played it that low before. So you're recognizing it based on relations between pitches or relative pitch rather than absolute pitch. Developmental psychologists have shown this ability emerges early, that six-month-old infants have this ability, human infants. So this is uh, called recognition based on relative pitch, and this is just a fact of cognition, irrespective of whether you believe music had an, uh, was an adaptive trait in human evolution or, or a purely cultural invention. Um, and then step three is to use the methods of comparative biology, which are well worked out by biologists, uh, comparative biologists, including people who worked in the department where I went to grad school, uh, in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And so you, you, do, you look for things like what are called homology or sharing of traits by common ancestry and convergence or sharing of traits that arose independently in order to figure out the history of traits. So if you're interested in how wings evolved, you reconstruct fossil history and, and there's a story about first four limbs evolving and then uh, uh, in, in a certain animals, two of those, the, two, the four limbs uh, evolved into wings for, for various reasons. Um, but in this kind of reconstruction in cognition, you're focusing on cognitive traits, not physical ones, using the tools of comparative psychology. Okay, so with that background, I want to talk briefly about cross-species studies of three things having to do with uh, basic aspects of music perception. Recognizing transposed pitch patterns, predicting the timing of musical beats, and having emotional responses to non-musical sounds. And these are all fundamental, I would argue, to our ability to derive meaning from instrumental music. And that's just as true if you're living in the Italian Renaissance as if you're listening to music in India. Okay, so let's talk about recognition of transposed pitch patterns and cross-species studies. There's actually a number of, there's actually numerous studies of this, starting with the work of Stuart Hulse, who was at Johns Hopkins back in the 1980s. And um, starlings were chosen to study this because these are animals that have complex uh, acoustics in their own natural communication system. They can easily learn to discriminate between two human melodies. That's no problem from them in the lab. Um, and their auditory circuits are very similar to those of mammals. Um, and they show actually a lot of similarities. They're among the best studied animal, non-human animals for, aud for auditory perception. They have many similarities in basic auditory perception, including the way they perceive the pitch of individual tones. So in the, the work that um, began this line of research, uh, people like Stuart Hulse had starlings in um, in operant boxes where they were trained to peck left if they heard a series of ascending tones as schematized on the left side of those dots, and peck the right key if they heard a series of falling tones. And they learned this, no problem. Um, and then what you do is you test generalization by shifting those tone sequences up or down in pitch, transposing them like the piccolo and tuba example. And uh, what was surprising is that when they were transposed, the starlings no longer recognized them. They had to completely relearn them as if they were brand new melodies. And that was surprising because they can do lots of other auditory generalization tasks. It's not that they're not good at auditory generalization, but this particular one they just have a lot of trouble with. And so a hypothesis evolved that for songbirds, the identity of a melody is really tied to the absolute pitches of notes, unlike for us. Um, and so it suggests this tone sequence recognition based on relative pitch is not just a basic widespread ability of brains that evolved early in evolution. Um, and that's actually consistent with human brain imaging that sh has shown that when you recognize a transposed pitch pattern, you're not just using the auditory cortex, uh, which is shown schematically on this slide, you're actually using that in collaboration with regions that are very far from auditory <coughs> cortex. 
including a region called the intraparietal sulcus on the right side of the brain, uh, shown in green here. This is a, um, a region in a typically part of the brain that we often associate with visuospatial processing. And in fact, it's, it's an important area for your ability to do mental rotation, to tell me whether or not those two objects on the right are just simply rotated versions of each other. You rely on that circuit, which has something to do with visual grasping and reaching and recognizing objects from different angles. So it seems that recognizing transposed melodies requires some kind of neural specialization where the auditory cortex actually has to outsource some of the processing to a different part of the brain that is good at recognizing shapes from different angles and communicate with it via long distance neural connections. Not just something that the auditory cortex does on its own. And then you might ask, why do we even do that? Why do we recognize melodies based on relative pitch? Why do we have these bizarre neural specializations? Um, well, actually, it could be related to a, an unusual aspect of our anatomy, and that is the sex differences in voice pitch that men and women have. As you know, adult men have voices that are lower than adult women by about an octave because of the growth of the larynx at the puberty, leading to the, this Adam's apple that, where the larynx actually physically grows and pushes out against the skin in males. Um, and so despite this difference in voice pitch between men and women, you, we use pitch patterns to communicate. So for example, statements and questions are often marked by changes, different ways of using pitch. So I'm going to Columbia to give a talk is a statement. I'm going to Columbia to give a talk is a question. And I use pitch rise at the end of that. If a woman says that sentence, it'll be all will be much higher than my voice. But for me to recognize that as a question, I have to be able to recognize the relative pattern, not the absolute pattern. So perhaps due to sex differences in voice pitch, uh, that we have and the need to recognize patterns based on relative pitch, this drove the evolution of neural specializations for relative pitch perception, including strong connections between auditory and parietal regions that we know from comparative neuroanatomy are much stronger in humans than um, our close relatives, monkeys. Okay, let's move on. Talk about predicting the timing of musical beats. So this is absolutely fundamental in, to dance in every culture. We dance by being able to predict the timing of beats and using that to synchronize with others. And that's just as true of uh, San Bushman in, in Australia, no, in Africa, thank you. And, and uh, as it is of, uh, again, Italian Renaissance dancers. So that's my last Italian reference. I did the best I could. Um, so this is an ability that develops spontaneously without training. Uh, it's, just, it's most demonstrated in the lab. Um, and actually, this is something that Nori Jacobi, a presidential scholar here, has worked extensively on. Um, if you ask somebody to just tap along with a metronome, they spontaneously align their taps very closely in time. So if those are metronome ticks, those vertical black bars, and the, the, the circles are a perfect coincidence, the black circles are perfect, perfect coincidence, the red balls show where somebody actually tapped, which is actually in anticipation, which means they're predicting the timing of the events. They can't be reacting, or you see a delay in their response after every event. This kind of precision uh, occurs across a wide range of tempi, that the metronome can be going slower or faster across a pretty wide range of people lock on spontaneously, don't need any musical training. And there's a common intuition that this seemingly simple, effortless ability that we have to predict the timing of beats reflects very ancient biological mechanisms. And one reason that's such a lovely intuition is that the biology is full of rhythms, right? There's the rhythm of the heartbeat. We know from modern neuroscience that the brain is full of neural oscillations. Those are rhythms. Um, so given that kind of background, a real surprise from primate research uh, came in 2009 from the first lab to try and train a monkey to tap to a metronome, which is a widely used task in human timing research. They really didn't expect the task to be difficult because monkeys understand the concept of basic intervals. You can train them to listen to a two-tone separated by a certain interval, the stimulus, and then tap twice to reproduce that interval. That's the response. They, le they learn that, no problem. Monkeys can also move predictively, so when they reach for things, they can reach predictively and grab things that are moving um, and by predicting where they're going to be. So the surprise of this research was that uh, tapping with a metronome is extremely hard for monkeys to learn. And when they did finally learn it, they tapped a few hundred milliseconds after the metronome events, not synchronized with them. So that's schematically shown here, which is just fundamentally unlike what we do spontaneously. And this has been replicated numerous times in the lab. And actually, this is interestingly consistent from previous work from the 60s that had kind of been forgotten about eye movements. And uh, I have a couple of quotes. They're going to be too small for you to read, so I won't bother uh, dwelling on them. Well, there they are, if you want to try and read them. But uh, the, in, in the 60s, they, they trained monkeys to move their eyes to a visual metronome that was, you know, I think it was flashing, or maybe it was a dot moving back and forth. Um, anyway, the monkeys learned to do this, but they never started to predict the metronome events, even though it was perfectly timed. And they put humans in the same situation, and they very quickly began to predict the timing of the events. You can see that in how they moved their eyes. 
the monkeys never did. Um, so this leads to a question, which is why do some species spontaneously predict the timing of beats, like us? And it turns out we're not the only ones. Um, uh, certain birds do this too. I was involved in some research showing that uh, parrots can move to the beat predictably and flexibly. Uh, the first case of another species besides humans that does this. But they do it spontaneously. They don't need food rewards. This develops through social interactions with humans, um, though they could do it without a human uh, dancing, so they're not just imitating. So why do certain animals do that prediction of, of beats? Well, maybe only certain animals find that intrinsically rewarding. As opposed to other animals, there's a, a paper showing that sea lions can be trained to, to train and move to a musical beat in a predictive way, but they have to be trained with fish rewards, and they don't do it uh, spontaneously. They only essentially, it's, a, it's their day job, right? Um, and so they're doing it because you're paying them and feeding them, whereas the bird does it just as with, in interaction with a human partner. We actually have a study unpublished yet where he'll even do it in a room where there's nobody there, just the music playing and, uh, and him dancing, though he'll dance more if there's a human in the room. Um, so this raise, raises the question, of, do monkeys have the cognitive machinery for predicting beats, but they just lack the intrinsic reward signal? So this led to a recent study that was just published this year where we, we built on this eye movement paradigm where we had monkeys synchronizing their eye movements to a visual metronome, so some, a box flashing left and right, left and right. And the monkey had to move its eyes to the target and it had to do it in a predictive way to get the reward. It only got rewarded if its eyes landed on the target just as the, as the box was appearing. That's when it got its little squirt of juice. And the only way to do that is by predicting, not by reacting. The thing we did differently from the tapping studies was that we, we gave a juice reward for every single predicted eye movement. So every time the monkey landed in time or close to the metronome, uh, it got a squirt of juice. In the previous studies, they, had, they waited till the end to reward them. And this seemed to really make the difference, and perhaps the fact that they were using their eyes. The monkeys in this uh, experiment actually acquired the ability to predictively synchronize to this visual metronome and to do it flexibly across tempi. So what that suggests is studies of the evolution of meaning-related mechanisms in music, like predicting beats, has to take the brain's reward circuitry into account. And uh, Jackie Gottlieb talked about the importance of the reward circuitry. And in neuroscience, we know that intrinsic rewards depend on specific neural pathways. So the dopamine system is obviously one of the big one players in this, in this regard. Um, and musical pleasure depends on connections between regions doing complex auditory processing and reward regions of the brain. Uh, it, musical pleasure does, does, doesn't arrive for free. You need some neural circuitry to support it. And we know this now uh, better in humans because of research on a new uh, phenomenon called musical anhedonia, where people who are not tone deaf and do not have any music perception deficits report having no pleasure in music. And this is confirmed by physiological measures. Uh, they don't seem to have any arousal when they listen to music that other people find pleasurable. Um, if you ask them to rate the pleasurableness of the music, basically they just push buttons randomly. Um, and recent neuroimaging research has shown that what's happening here is some sort of a disconnect between their auditory perception areas and the reward areas of the brain that for most of us are connected. So this intrinsic reward of prediction of beats seems to be something that happened to us in evolution. Um, finally, having emotional responses to non-biological sounds. And this is really a hallmark of music perception. So if you think about it, it's kind of odd, as David pointed out, that um, we can have such strong responses to sounds that are not made by other organisms or by people or that had a, kind of an evolutionary history in our past as being ecologically important. One of my favorite examples of this comes from a study by Emmanuel Vigan where he played clips of music to individuals and had them rate or classify the emotions they felt in response to the clip of music. And then he grouped the clips depending on which sorts of emotions they evoked. So this is just one of the clips that he used. We did this whole experiment with these 30 second clips, had people rate them and group them, and he grouped them based on the emotions evoked. And then he brought in another set of listeners and did the whole experiment again, and he reduced all the clips to one second long. So this is what the person would have heard in this condition in the second experiment. You're done with that trial, let's move on. Um, and the surprising thing was he got remarkably similar results in terms of the emotions evoked and the groupings that uh, he got at the end. So in other words, not only do we get emotional responses to non-biological sounds, we can get them incredibly quickly. Um, 
And this is one idea is that this is partly due to the overlap in the way the brain processes instrumental musical sounds and vocal sounds. And this is an old idea. It actually goes back to Rousseau and Herbert Spencer and David Huron has worked on this. But the idea that something about our brains, even though we would never consciously confuse the sound of, hu of human voice and a musical instrument, parts of our brains are treating them in an overlapping way and reacting to their emotional qualities in an overlapping way. And there's some research in neuroscience that, that potentially supports that. Um, imaging research like that of Joseph Rauschecker, um, where they image the brain um, responding to instrumental musical sounds, to vocal sounds, and then looking at areas that respond to both. And in this slide, you see some areas that respond strongly to speech but not music, some strongly to music but not speech, and then some shown in white that do respond strongly to both. Um, so you could ask, do any other species have emotional responses to non-biological sounds? Why are we having these strong responses to sounds that just clearly are not human sounds, or not made by biological agents? Um, and I mean emotions to non-biological sounds that aren't based on rewards and punishment, right? So if you play, uh, Mozart for a dog and you always feed it at the same time you play the Mozart, you're going to get the Pavlov effect, right? So the dog's going to come to love Mozart, nothing to do with Mozart. It's the dinner bell, essentially. Um, but apart from that, I mean, just listening without some sort of external reward or punishment. Well, actually, this is something we could address now. So going back to the dogs and music, uh, well, for currently, there's very little evidence that animals experience any pleasure and emotional response to non-biological sounds. But you could actually now ask this question. Recently, a group, a group at, I think, uh, Emory has developed fMRI for awake, um, un unanesthetized behaving dogs and uh, are able to put a, a dog in a scanner and, and this is a, a study showing activation in reward areas of the brain in response to signals that are associated with getting food, hand signals that the, they see from the owner that's a, that are associated with getting rewards. So you could actually theoretically put a dog in a scanner and have it listen to the music that it's grown up with in its household, just like the children in the household it lives with, and see if it's activating pleasure centers, if it's actually getting rewards from just purely listening. Uh, I would be surprised uh, if that was the case, and I suspect that these, this sense of pleasure we get from non-biological signals may be something that is a rather specialized aspect of our brains. But you could actually take this kind of observation and turn it into science uh, through this kind of technique. All right. So this raises the question of whether our auditory system is actually unusual in the degree of overlapping of processing uh, conspecific sounds, sounds made by our own species, versus non-biological sounds, that kind of overlap I showed you in the brain, and whether that might actually be a recent evolutionary development in humans, that we allow non-biological sounds to influence our, uh, our processing in this way. And you could actually study that empirically with animals like zebra finches that are studied here in Columbia by Sarah Woolley and her group. Um, <coughs> You, zebra finches have parts of their brain uh, that are uh, both involved in producing song and that respond when it hears bird song, like this uh, center label, labeled at the top with the little electrode going down in it. And, um, and you could ask if a bird is raised in an environment with non-biological sounds around a lot, like musical sounds, would those brain areas begin to respond to those sounds or are they sort of sealed off even after lots of experience and exposure to other sounds to just process their own species specific sounds? Um, if so, it would suggest that this overlap that we have is not just explainable by experience, it's something unusual about our brains. Okay, so just to conclude, I think some of the basic mental processes we use to derive meaning from music actually rely on some fairly recent neural specializations. And this goes against common intuitions, I think. So the idea that recognizing transposed melodies is a specialization of our brain, nobody thought that was going to be the case. People that did the Starling research thought this is something that birds will easily do and that'll let us study the brain mechanisms involved. Predicting musical beats, nobody thought that was going to be difficult. The monkey researchers thought this is going to be a very simple, basic ability. We'll see monkeys will do it just like humans and we'll go and look at the brain mechanisms involved. Not that simple. Having an emotional response to non-biological sounds, well, that's a bit of a, more of an open question. But there's this bias to think that other animals do have this response, um, including to our music, but there's no real evidence for it. So, in conclusion, how do our brains get meaning from music? I think one uh, important way of thinking about this is to understand how ancient and recent brain mechanisms are involved uh, in processing musical meaning and how those interact. Thank you.